Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, come on. He makes a way. about me let me tell you about my Jesus oh come on he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Restore 
and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great Your name is lifted high, Jesus. We love you and we praise you and we ask you that you will be with us as we hear, as we learn more about you. Father, we ask that your presence will move in this room. We open our hearts and our minds to you. You are welcome in this place. So have your way, Jesus. Have your way in us. Have your way through every person that walks on this stage. Give us the wisdom to recognize your presence in these moments. We love you, Father. And it's in your name that your church says, amen. Amen. Can we lift him high one more time? Come on. Well, church, we're so glad that you're with us this morning, especially with how cold it is. I'm very surprised at how many people there is in here. Uh, but before you're seated, please turn to your side and tell somebody there that Jesus loves them. morning again. Hey, Brandon Lute here with you, gang. Welcome. Hey, if you're joining us online or you're in the house, welcome to you guys. If you're new to this space, 
you're looking around thinking, man, I love everything about what just happened. You seem like my people. How do I get connected to a place like this? You can text the word connect to the number on the screen or after the service, if you're thinking like, man, I am not gonna text your, your, your situation there. If you wanna go to the atrium, you can do that too. Meet some really cool people out in the Welcome Center. Either way, we're gonna help you take steps to get plugged into the life of this church. You'll be really blessed if you do. Because we really make it our goal, our aim, our vision to live and to love like Jesus. That's the goal here. That's what we wanna do. So if that resonates with you, take a step, and I know that you'll be blessed if you do. Well, I've got two really cool announcements for you guys. The first one, I want you to pencil in. Next Sunday, after both services, we're gonna be offering our Intro to VCC partner time together, right? So if you're interested, <clears throat> what does it look like to be a VCC partner? What is the DNA? What makes up this church? This is a great opportunity for you to jump in. It's just a 30 minute session. After each service, you could choose one of them. Plan on attending that and getting some really good information. The second one is, for those of you who call this your church home, you're like, yes, VCC partner, I know exactly what that means, and you wanna jump in, well, on Saturday, January 27th, we're gonna have our VCC partner winter gathering. Everybody's invited. I wanna say that very clear, everyone is invited, and we especially wanna see our VCC partners because we're gonna celebrate what God has done in 2023, and we're gonna give a sneak peek of some things that we're jumping into in 2024 that we're super excited about. Now, you do have to register for that one because we're gonna have a meal together and we wanna have a really good accurate head count on who's coming to this thing so we can have plenty of food for you guys. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We celebrate that, we love it. It's such an honor uh, to think about a man who, like I said before, worked so tirelessly to bring hearts and minds into alignment when it comes to unity. And with joy and humility, I think about the life of this church. This church represents such a beautiful, rich tapestry of that very vision of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He had a vision in which justice would flow like a mighty stream, and in this church, we want to live out kingdom values for the transformation of hearts and minds in our community. He had a dream that was in alignment with Jesus' prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very heart cry of why we do what we do here at the Vineyard. So we celebrate that, we get behind it, and we recognize we need the Holy Spirit's help in that very endeavor. If we're going to embrace diversity, if we're going to be about biblical unity, we need the Holy Spirit's help to help us walk this thing out arm in arm, hand in hand, breaking down barriers in our church and in our community so that we can see hearts and minds transform, so that every individual is heard and seen and loved. And I'm super proud to announce that because of work like the Healing Center, because of mission strips, because of our commitment to biblical unity, the Holy Spirit is doing good things in and through this community. And it is because of your contributions that fuel that very ministry. Your tithes, your offerings help to make that very work of transformation possible. And so if you call Vineyard Cincinnati your church home, your spiritual home, and you came today prepared to give, you can do that one of three ways. You can text the number on the screen, you can give online, or you can offer it in any one of the boxes on the way out today. So with all of that in mind, would you pray with me over today's offering? Father, I believe it's actually in alignment with your heart that we would stand united. That diversity would be fully embraced because the, by the nature of the Trinity, it is a diversity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and you put that heart inside of us for the transformation of people and communities. And so with open hands, we just offer all that we have to you today. We come to you with open hands, recognizing that it is all yours. So Holy Spirit, continue to stir our hearts today, and we trust you with what you're gonna do in and through your people in this time. Thank you, amen.
So on Twitter last week, or I guess I should say X, thank you, Elon Musk, uh, a guy posted this New Year's resolution. He said, I want to be in better shape, I want to get better physically, and I want to be better financially. I want to save money. But then he went on to write, but I'm not sure it's possible to do both. So for the first part, I'm going to start a gym, and I'm going to call the gym Resolution. And I'm going to take membership fees, and I'm going to work out there for a month. And after a month, I'm going to change the name of the gym to Regret. And I'm going to make it be a taco bar. And I'm like, he quit before he even started. Like he, just, he, didn't, he didn't even get started, and he's already quit. How many of you guys feel like that in terms of New Year's resolutions? Like, like what did we say last week? Of all the resolutions made, millions upon millions of people make resolutions, and only 9% of them are kept. Only 9% make it past one month. We quit before we even start. And and what I said last week, which I agree with wholeheartedly, at its core, I think New Year's resolutions are us saying, I really want to be better. I really want to be a better person. I want to, but, but, but the means to be better is these doing. We, 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 in order to be better, we create things to do, and we always fail. And the reason why I fail, why we fail, and I don't even make resolutions so I won't fail, but I believe the reason why we fail is because we weren't made to do more. Doing's good, but God did not hardwire us to do more, first and foremost. God hardwired us to be more. Remember, we're human beings, not human de- doings, and God has invited us into being with him more so that we do what we want to do. One of my idols in life has been Martin Luther King Jr. I think he stood for what God wanted us to stand for. He, he wanted to end racism and bring about change in the world, and he did it through peaceful change. He was a man, he wasn't perfect, he was a man like anybody, but he was committed to abiding, to being with Jesus so that he would do what God had called him to do. He said this, he said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. He was so committed to being with God regularly and let his doing flow out of his being. In 1958, like 10 years before he was brutally assassinated, he was at his first ever book signing. And while he's signing the book, this woman walked up to him and said, are you Martin Luther King Jr.? He looked at her and looked back down to sign and said, yes, I am. And all of a sudden, he felt a sharp knife in his chest as he was stabbed five times. Many don't know this, but he was stabbed five times and they rushed him to the hospital. Obviously, he survived. He lived for another 10 years. But in in the newspapers the next day, it said that the knife point came so close to his aorta, if he had sneezed, he would have died. And one of the first things he did publicly in the newspapers was say, I forgive that woman. Well, then letters poured in from dignitaries and people all over the world well-wishing him and saying, we're so sorry this happened. And he said, of all the letters from presidents, heads of state, senators, the one letter that grabbed him most was a young 14-year-old girl. And he said it grabbed him most because in the letter he saw this peaceful abiding that leads to peaceful protest was actually changing hearts. Here's what she wrote in the letter. Dear Dr. King, I'm a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing to you to say I'm so happy you didn't sneeze. It was making a change. and he, he knew it was decision to connect with the Father, with God, to be with God every day that resulted in him doing better. He, he quoted that letter 10 years later, in 1968, the night before he died. In, in one of his two most famous speeches, I've been to the mountaintop speech. And he quoted that letter as if to say that, like, like I'm so glad I didn't sneeze as well because God has used this movement to change hearts, but, but it's okay. I've been with Jesus, and it's okay. And he closes that, I've been to the mountaintop speech, like hours before he was shot. And he said these powerful words. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. 
But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've connected with my Father in heaven. I've been with him. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. I want my doing to flow out of being. He's allowed me to go to the mountaintop. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Man, that'll preach. How is he able to say that? Like, like I've got to tell you, if I was in the midst of that kind of racism, being treated that horrifically, being bitten by dogs and blown over by, by fire hoses, I don't know that I would talk with that kind of grace. But he had this passionate resolve that was rooted, that was based in being with Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Again, not perfect, but he modeled for us being with Jesus. That's the kind of people we want to be. In the face of all difficulties, we are so connected with Jesus. We've been with Jesus so much that people see our lives and say, I want to know the God they know. That's what it looks like to know Jesus. We, we've got a crazy year ahead of us. 2024 is an election year. Every year is an election year. Circle on your calendars and go, it's going to get crazy. And there's, there's a t- this time, unlike any other, is for us to be resolved to be with Jesus so that our doing reflects the living God. And the world says, wow, they're a non-anxious presence in the midst of chaos. I want to know the God they know. That's why we're doing this series. That's why we're starting off this year with this idea of being with Jesus. We, as we said, as Brandon just said, our mission is to live and love like Jesus, to be people that so know Jesus and connect with Jesus that we live and love like him. And the way to do that is to be, to be disciples who make disciples. And it starts with being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and then doing what he did in that order. Many of us start the Christian life off doing things. The, the, the first command and first call is to be with Jesus so that we become like Jesus. And out of that, then we do what Jesus did. Right before Jesus was crucified to take the sins of the world upon himself and then rose again powerfully to show that he's God, he had two discourses in John chapter 15 and John chapter 16, the, 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 the letter that John the apostle wrote, one of Jesus' disciples, and saw him risen and remembered the conversation in 15 and 16. 16 is saying, hey, you're going to get my Holy Spirit put in you, my counselor, my helper, that will help you live this journey. And right before that, he he does John 15, which talks about the means to in, in, encounter the Holy Spirit and stir the Holy Spirit in our lives. Here's what he says, these famous words, we're going to unpack these today. He's looking at the guy sitting around the table, and he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me. Hold on to that word. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him and her, he or she it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He or she is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, there are two verses in here that just make us go, oh, that sounds really shocking and harsh. Let's just set those aside for a second. There are three primary focuses you need to have in this order. The vine, abiding, and fruit. Keep the order in your mind. The vine, abiding, and fruit. Let me unpack each one. First and foremost is Jesus is saying, I'm the vine. Seven different times in the Gospel of John, he makes these I am statements. With every I am statement, he's saying, I'm God, you're not. And he gives us these symbolic or analogous 
things to show I'm where life is found. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then this one, I am the vine. I'm the source of life. You're the branch. The branch without a vine is dead. The branch apart from the vine cannot live. But but he's given two really strong symbols here. The vine to the Jew, this is written to a Jewish audience first and foremost, saw the vine as their symbolic symbol of nationalism. It showed, man, we're a proud nation. And many of the people found their identity in their nation before God. How many of us can do that sometimes? I love my country, but I cannot find my identity in my country first. He's saying, I'm the true vine. And secondly, the vine represented the grapes to the Jew, which was their source of economy. It was their primary way to make money. So Jesus is saying, I'm bigger than your nationalism, and I'm bigger than your economy. Whatever money you find identity in, or whatever country you find identity in, I'm the true source. And, and today, we could put that in, he, he could say, I'm the true family. I'm the true house. I'm the true 401k plan. I'm the true uh, sports I'm the true girlfriend or boyfriend. I'm bigger than that. I'm, I'm the source of life. You can't live apart from me. And I'm, I'm here to give you life. And the second word is abide. The big idea is I want you to remain in me. The word abide is a word that means remain, wait, be mindful of, aware of, give ongoing attention to, prioritize once a day and throughout the day. It's not just about a quiet time. This isn't about some passive thing, I'm just having a quiet time. I I, I personally don't like the phrase quiet time. It's not wrong, it's not bad. It's not in the Bible anywhere, but it just sounds so passive. I'm having a quiet time. Sounds like I've been putting time out. So for a dude, I didn't like that. I didn't, it always felt so, I I, want to call it the abiding time, because abiding is a, a, a time in the day where I carve out to be with him, to hear his voice, to connect with him, but it's also about walking with him throughout my day, being mindful, making him my priority, putting him first. The big idea Jesus is trying to drive is that I'm the source of life. I'm to be your first priority, not because he needs to be our first priority, but when we prioritize him first, we experience him and all he has for us. If we don't prioritize him first, we miss out on the abundant life he promises. And the third thing is fruit. Fruit is a result. Fruit is not the focus. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit, we talk about this as love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, all these good words that come out of us when we bend with Jesus. We we become a non-anxious presence, and then we share the love of Jesus with others. But again, the focus is on the vine Jesus, and on abiding, being connected with him throughout the day, it's not on the fruit. Some of us get stressed out. We're like, what about the fruit? You don't need to focus on fruit. Let me just ask you a question. Is an apple tree sitting around focusing on fruit? Is it focused on, ah, I gotta make fruit, ah. No. An apple tree is focused on the soil. It's focused on being, receiving sun, receiving light, receiving water. And when it does, Fruit happens. Your, your, yours and my primary job is to be with Jesus, the one who loves us most. And when we abide, remain in, in the vine, make him our first priority throughout the day and carve out space, fruit will happen. Now, twice in this passage, he gives a really strong wine warning. He says, look, if you don't bear fruit, which is a result of abiding, you will die. You'll be removed. You'll be cut off. Now, this can feel really legalistic. It can feel really like, oh no, is God threatening me? This is, look, this means, some, some people say it means being propped up, set aside. I, I don't believe if you're a Christ follower, you can ever be removed from the family of God. If the Holy Spirit is in you, you're, you're, you're forever saved. But he's saying here, regardless of how you take this theologically, you're going to miss out. If we don't abide in the vine, we're not going to be in the game. We're going to not experience the joy of connection with God. I, I talk to people all the time. It's like, I'm not experiencing the great life with Jesus, like the, the abundant life. And I'm like, are, are you abiding? Is he your priority? 
Well, no, my girlfriend is. My 401k is. I mean, you look at their, you, all you got to do is look at our calendar and look at our wallet and how we spend our money, spend our time, and you go, that's what your priority is. Is, your, is our priority Jesus? This is what's, what's being taught by Jesus here is for us to know one thing and ask another thing, to be really honest with ourselves, to know I can't survive apart from Jesus, and then to ask, am I actually connected to Jesus? Is Jesus actually my first priority? To ask very honestly, am I actually a true follower of Jesus? Am, am I, is he actually my priority? Again, if we walked up to an apple tree and there were no apples ever on this tree, wouldn't we wonder if it's an apple tree? I, it's like, it's not an apple tree. Yeah, but it's an apple tree, but there are no apples, never. So it must, must not be an apple tree, or if it is an apple tree, it's a dormant dead apple tree. It's not experiencing what it's here for, again, the focus <clears throat> is not on the fruit. The focus is on the vine. And when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, I mean, clearly, we can do lots of things apart from Jesus. We can go to work, we can go to school, we can go to hang out with people, but, but are we gonna really thrive? Jesus is inviting us to thrive. And, and again, this is not a threat. It's a consequence. This isn't our good Father in heaven going, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off. It's a consequence. It's, it's like if you're a parent, we've all, those of us that have been parents, when you look at your kid and say, hey, if you play in the street, you'll get hit by a car. Or if you touch the stove, you'll burn. We're not threatening. I'm going to take your hand and put it on the stove. I'm going to burn you. I'm going to throw you in the street and I want to see you get hit by a car. No, no. I'm saying I really don't want to see you get hit by a car. I really don't want to see you burn your hand. But if you do, that's the consequence. I want you, a father would say, mother would say, I want you to connect with me. I want you to know who you are. When we abide, we experience the fruit and joy of deep connection with our father. We experience love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control that he's promised us. Do we take him up on the promise? A.W. Tozer, I love what he says in one of his books. He says the idea that like, you can be a Christ follower and not experience all that Christ has for you. Here's what he says. The presence and the manifestation of the presence are not the same. In other words, if you abide with Jesus, you'll experience the manifestation of the presence. If you're a Christian, you, you'll have the presence of the Holy Spirit in you, but you're not experiencing all that he has for you. There can be one without the other, presence or manifestation of the presence. God is here when we are wholly unaware of it. He is manifest only when, when and as we're aware of his presence. Only as we abide and become aware do we see the manifestation of his presence. On our part, there must be surrender to the Spirit of God for his work it is to show us the Father and the Son. When we abide, we see Jesus moving. We hear his voice. If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us, and that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his face. This is the invitation. This is the promise. And Jesus goes on to say in the next five verses, look, if you abide in me, let me tell you the promise. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. By this my Father's glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That means demonstrate that you're my disciples. Not, not, you're not prove, doing this to earn, but it just shows, ah, that's a, that's a follower, that's a fruit tree. He goes on to say, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, just sit in my love. This is a Father who bask in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus is beckoning us. He's begging us, please jump in with me. Again, our Father in heaven doesn't need us. He's just, I don't mean that in a harsh way. He doesn't need us. We need him. If he lived, he died, he truly rose, rose again, he's God. Do we prioritize him first in our lives? We need him. We need what he, who he is. We, we need what he offers. We, it's, it's an abiding that we find out who we are to him, and we live as he's called us to live, and he's promising us love and joy. Abide in my love, and you'll, and you'll get your prayers answered. 
Now, this is not saying, oh, gosh, I'm going to ask for a Beamer now. I'm going to get a bigger house. I'm going to win the lottery. That's not what it's saying. If, if we are so connected with him, we will know him more intimately. We'll know him more deeply. We'll know what he wants. And then we'll be satisfied in him. And then we'll do what he wants and what we ask for. He'll be like, I'm doing that. And I, I want my, my wife to know Jesus more deeply. I want my husband to be more connected with Jesus. I want my kids. There's no promise in these things. But he's saying, look, I, I'm, I'm going to meet you. And you'll encounter a full life in me. And, and by the way, physiologically, the promises of abiding are huge. Scientifically. I mean, the world calls it meditation or mindfulness. Scripture's been way ahead of this. What, what, what they call abiding is mindfulness and meditation. <clears throat> and scientific studies show if you're mindful on a higher power, it will lower your blood pressure, decrease anxiety, decrease stress, improve sleep, speed up metabolism, which will cause you to lose weight, It'll create clarity and thinking, which increases creativity and focus at work. It'll make us more patient, bring about more happiness. It's shown to decrease depression, mitigate chronic fatigue, stop headaches, and help irritable bowel syndrome. That's all I need to hear right there, that last one. I'm in. Right? Like, like, again, and this doesn't require insurance. It's free. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. I'm not saying don't take ibuprofen. But he's inviting us into more, and the benefits to us are huge. We're we, as a church, are begging us as a community to live out of a place of abiding, to see Jesus as our true vine and abide with him as such so that we change our schools, our workplaces, our homes, our neighborhoods. We live differently because we've been differently. This is for us. God wants nothing from you. So here's my question. This is my question to me, question to you. Is Jesus your first priority? Do you see him as your true vine? Do you put your hope in other things first? I mean, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. C.S. Lewis said, seek first things first. Put first things first. You'll get second things thrown in. Put second things first. You'll lose both the first and the second things. Where is our priority? Where is our focus? If Jesus is our priority, we will live accordingly. We will carve out space to abide with him, to be with him. You've been wondering, many of you have been wondering about these ladders. I've had multiple people come and say, what's with the ladders? <clears throat> well, this ladder obviously represents life with Jesus. This ladder represents life without Jesus. You can decide to go one of two ways. You can decide, I want life with Jesus. I'm going to go after Jesus with all that I am. I believe he lived, died, and rose again. I'm going to put my faith in him and follow him. And you could also decide, I don't want to follow him. I don't want life with him. Here's the thing. Both... I respect both decisions. I respect being in, fully in on either decision. Here's the problem with a lot of us. We say this is our way. We say I'm all in, but we live like this practically. I actually respect the person that is all in here. Even though I don't agree it's the best way to go, I respect their decision to be all in, to be like, I'm living my own life. I'm going to have sex with whoever I want to sex, have sex with. I'm going to spend my money however I want to spend my money. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I, I, Hey, they're living their conviction. We as Christ followers, we're saying this is our conviction. I'm all in with Jesus. But we say, I believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again. I put my faith in him fully. But I live like my life is my life. I can do what I want. We, we say my time is his time. But man, you look at your calendar, we barely give him any time at all. We say, man, it's all his money. But man, when you look at your wallet, you're like, oh, he gets nothing. 10%? I even give him 10%. We say, my wife, my kids, this is getting high. But, ugh. See what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I'm going to get split apart. We have a decision. We say I'm all in, but we live, and we're going to get split. You're actually more honest if you live this way. I see Glenn Drees, our insurance guy over here, going, what is going on here? <laughs> Are we all in with Jesus or not? We, I say get all in. Get all in, it'll change your life. This is for you, not for me. Be all in, and you'll experience the joy. If you're not experiencing the joy, you're not all in. I promise you. You have a decision. I have a decision. Every day. By the way, can I say with this illustration? I could have gone higher, but I chose not to. I mean, I did it in the practice. I just... Um, <laughs>
Wow. I, it's so shocking on so many levels. Let's turn that off quick. So here's the invitation. We're inviting you to carve out space every day, at least 30 minutes a day, and then throughout your day, be mindful of the Lord. A guy named Frank Laubach, he carved out, he said at the, at the top of every hour, he said to just stop for a minute to be mindful of Jesus. Say, Jesus, I thank you for being God. I need you. You lived and died and rose again. But we're, we're inviting you to a, a four-step process once a day to carve out time to be with Jesus, to stop and be still, kind of a space to stop, be still, then look, look at a scripture verse, look at a, a chapter, whatever fits your, your mold, start in the book of John if you want, look at that scripture verse and look at Jesus and in the stopping being still, you're saying, God, where's my heart? I'm looking at you, I see you as my savior. Then we, then we ask God, speak to me through your, your scripture, speak to me through your Holy Spirit, and then we respond, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? We, we have a, a prayer journal. We have two journals. You can text abide on the screen. Text the screen. We have, we have some prayer journals. We're going to have a prayer room up here starting tomorrow. Uh, pardon me, Tuesday. It's going to be open 24, not 24 7, like 10 hours a day from 7 to 7 every day. Come in and, get, come in and just pray. But, but carve out space. I don't care if you go for, I know it's freezing outside, but go for walks outside, listening to worship. Carve out space to be present with Jesus so that you experience his presence. This is for us. Let us live lives where we're so connected with him. We make him our first love, our first prayer, so that we experience his love. We experience the joy of being with him. I want to take some time. We're going to do some, some worship right now and just practice these four things as a community. And, and I invite you. Would you just do me a favor and close your eyes? Would you? And we're going to take some time to stop and be still right now. And I invite you, if you've got a phone on you, set it aside. Set it on the floor. Don't let, it, don't let it touch your body. Nothing wrong with a phone. I don't want to go to life before a phone. But the phone can be a distraction. When you do this space of abiding, set the phone aside so you can be still and not be distracted. Let's just start right now with the stop part and be still. I like to open my hands, put it on my knees. There's nothing mystical or magical, but I just kind of say, God, I'm open. Holy Spirit, I'm open. If, if you're here this morning, by the way, if you never put your faith in Jesus, you're, you're, up the, you're up the without Jesus ladder, and you're saying, I'm tired of that ladder, then just say right now, Jesus, I admit my need, I admit my sin, I'm going to give my life to you. And believe that right now Holy Spirit's filling you. If you're, if you're in the category of like many of us, man, you're split. I believe in Jesus. I believe he lived, died, and rose again, but I'm living split. I'm living life how I want to live life. I'm, I'm living life on my terms. Just confess that. Repent that. Just stop and be still. Say, Jesus, I want to live like you're my true vine. And I come now to be still with you. Just lean into Jesus right now for two minutes. We'll be quiet.
I know this sounds basic, but I just feel like I hear the Holy Spirit saying, I want my children to know just how much I love them. I just love them. I just want to be with them. I want them to be with me, to know my love, to be so rooted in my love. And Father, as just one person, I repent of looking elsewhere to find love. I repent of all the things I go to that I think will bring me joy and happiness. It's just, they're good things, but they're not ultimate. You're the ultimate. Help me to find life in you as my ultimate life. I look at you. I want to look at you as my first love. Teach us how to do that. Teach us how to abide. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to stir, to move. We want more of you, Jesus. We just want to create some more space to be still, to look at Jesus, to ask him to speak. We're just going to lean into some worship here in a minute. Just however you want to posture yourself, let's just make space to be with Jesus, the one who lived and died and rose again, the one who loves you most.
Church, I don't know why I feel compelled to share, but I felt convicted during this talk. I 
confess that I've been on that ladder and I've been jumping back and forth and been doing the whole I'm in but I'm not and so for me I don't know about you for me I'm using this moment to first repent but to tell him that I don't want to live that way anymore that I want to be all the way in that you can take all this world but just give me Jesus and I know that will be enough that will be more than enough So can we say that again? I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You are my one thing. I don't want anyone else. I don't need anything else. You are my one thing. You
want to keep giving space, just acknowledge our need. I think that may be the number one New Year's resolution that I feel like I'm supposed to continue to make is, God, I need you. Like, I can't do it without you. I know I live like I can because I want to be strong. I want to live in control. But the more I relinquish control and say, God, you're God, I'm not. It's freedom. So I want to invite our ministry teams down, down here, up there. And there's anything you want prayer for, come down and get prayer. Just say, man, I, if, if, your, if your prayer is, I, I can't do it on my own. And I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. If, if it's, man, I'm blew it last night, or I blew it this morning, or whatever. We all have. Just come and say, if you don't want to get prayer, turn to the people with you and say, I, I need Jesus. And they need a friend with me to walk with Jesus. We have communion down here. We have a ministry slide that people that have heard God's voice speak to them. Just, if there's anything on this, this slide that you resonate with, that you, know, that's, you came in asking that question. Come get prayer about that. Let's just sit and be with Jesus. Give space to be. So let me, let me just pray us out. Jesus, we are desperate for you. We're desperate to experience more of your love, experience more of your presence. We want to experience the manifestation of your presence in our life. We repent of looking everywhere else for love. We want to be with you. Let us be people that prioritize you as our first love. Let us get off a strat on the ladders. Lord, we, our resolution is to be all in with you. In your precious and holy name, amen. Thanks for coming. We'll see you guys next week.